Today we are having a class on tumors of middle ear and mastoid. Uh, welcome to the class and malignant tumors. Of the benign tumors, the glomus tumors are the most the temporal bone, the squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest malignant tumor. There can be several other tumors. Uh, in uh, benign tumors, hemangiomas and osteomas are other common tumors. And in the malignant tumors, rhabdomyosarcoma is the other next com most common malignant tumor of the temporal bone. This doesn't mean that these tumors themselves are very common. It means that uh, it, it means that among the uncommon temporal bone tumors, these uh, tumors are the commonest. So we will use uh, these tumors as a sort of a template for you to learn about the tumors of the temporal bone, how they behave, and uh, there will be a sort of a prototype for you to understand the treatment and diagnosis. The first uh, tumor we are going to discuss today is a glomus. Glomus tumors are a group of benign tumors. They are sporadic and can have a familial tendency with autosomal dominant trait. These tumors arrive from the neural crest. This is a slight histopathology of a glomus tumor. I hope it is visible. Okay. This is a slide the characteristic cells and then you have uh, vessels with uh, without any muscular lining of the vessels. So these are the characteristic glomus tumor, the tumor encapsulated. It is made up of cells with large nuclei and the vessels, are, uh, the vessels don't have any muscular coating. These tumors are estimated to have an annual incidence of 1 per 1.3 million of population, and they are the commonest tumor of the middle ear. The male female ratio is to 1 is 3 is to 6. So, depending on the various studies, it can be either 1 is to 3 or 1 is to 6. This is more female patients. For some reason, the commonly involved compared to the right side. And the age at presentation is usually 40 to 70 years. That doesn't mean all patients are at 40 to 70 years in childhood and uh, same old age, but it is a middle age group. And uh, the tumor is multicentric in about 3 to 10 cases. In family cases, the multicentricity is much more, but in the sporadic cases, only 3 to 10 percent of the tumors are multicentricity. That means if Lomus tympanic to be the only tumor, but there's a small chance that there can be other glomus tumors in the body. They can occur in the abdomen, in the thorax, and various other parts as well. Based on the location or origin of the tumor, we can have an anatomical classification of the tumor into glomus jugular and glomus tympanicum. The glomus jugular arises from the dome of the jugular bulb and uh, it invades the hypotypanum and jugular forum. Cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12 can be involved in these tumors, and there is jugular vein compression. If the tumor arises strictly from the promontory of the middle ear, it usually does not go into the jugular foramen and compress the cranial nerves. It involves initially the structures of the middle ear and can cause possibly cause facial palsy. Is, is some benign tumors also have a tendency to metastasize tumors, those tumors, and there is a rare chance of distant lymph node involvement and very rarely lung and bone metastasis. However, local spread is most common and that is the root of spread of the tumor. From the middle ear, it can spread 
medially to the labyrinth petrus pyramid, posteriorly to the mastoid, inferiorly it can involve the jugular foramen and 9 to 12th cranial nerve, and through the eustachian tube it can spread to the nasopharynx, posterior and middle cranial fossae. What are the clinical features of this tumor? If the tumor is in the tympanic, then you can see this finding. I'll play this video. Just look at the finding or otoscopy. I hope the video is visible. I borrowed this video from YouTube. You can see that uh, the tympanic membrane is a pulsation, and uh, the pulsation uh, is more and is reddish. You can see the tumor blush behind the intact tympanic membrane arising from inferiorly and going up. This sign is known as rising sun sign. Since the tumor is unencapsulated and highly vascular, if we increase the intracanalicular pressure by using a Siegel speculum, there will be a branching of the tumor. This sign is known as brown sign. The patient can present with a progressive conductive hearing loss because of the tumor occupying the middle ear cavity, reducing the middle ear cavity volume. And uh, there can also be a pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, uh, involves the middle ear and there is a damage to the tympanic membrane. It can present as an oral polyp. Oral polyp is a common uh, finding in chronic otitis media. And uh, this is confused for an oral polyp. The difference between the usual oral polyp and oral polyp by a Glomus tumor is that it is it leads profusely to the touch because it is highly vascular. The patient can have uh, pulsatile tinnitus along with it, and there is usually some complications such as dizziness and facial palsy. The uh, ear discharge or otoria is usually scanty and blood type of ear discharge. In case the tumor is involving the jugular foramen and involving the cranial nerves 9 to 12, it can cause uh, other syndromes or cranial nerve syndromes known as jugular foramen syndromes. This is an important question for MCQs and uh, in your entrance exams, you can be asked about these syndromes. The clinical features of these syndromes are dysarthria, dysphagia, paralysis of the soft palate, pharynx and vocal cords and weakness of the trapezius. The syndromes are uh, named and uh, the various named syndromes are Kohler Sicard syndrome, where all four cranial nerves 9, 10, 11, and 12 are involved, and there is no additional uh, symptomatology or syndrome presentation. Then there is Villaret syndrome 9, 10, 11, 12, and sympathetic chain is involved due to involvement of the sympathetic plexus and ganglia. There is Vernet syndrome, where only cranial nerves 9, 10, and 11 are involved. So, hypoglossal nerve is not involved in this. There is Jackson syndrome, where 10, 11, 12 are involved, cranial nerve 9 is not involved, Smith syndrome, and Tapia syndrome. So, among these, the most famous are Cole, Chicard, Willaret, and Vernet syndrome. And you can expect in your entrance exam possibility of one of these syndromes being asked. The other clinical features can be because of secretion of catecholamines. Like I mentioned, about 3% of the patient can have secretion of catecholamines. Catecholamines can cause systemic presentation and problems such as uh, tachycardia and uh, it can cause dryness and uh, hypertension. So all these are features of catecholamine secretion. Because of the mass effect, there can be compression of the jugular bulb, jugular vein, and it can also cause uh, compression of other adjacent structures in the middle ear, it can cause conductive type of hearing loss. The, uh, once a patient presents with these features, if you are suspecting a glomus tumor, the important investigations will be imaging investigations and uh, lastly, histopathological investigations. So because it is a highly vascular tumor, if you directly do any biopsy or something like that, you can end up with a disastrous bleeding. Plus it's in a very delicate area. The first investigation for a temporal bone tumor is usually a high resolution CT scan of the temporal bone. Here you can see both sides. The jugular foramen is involved with the tumor, which has expanded and uh, it has eroded and it has uh, uh, you can you can see this is a temporomandibular joint. This is the mastoid. This is the jugular foramen. Compared with the other side, you can see the enlarged tumor. Okay, so a CT scan is important to show the bony destruction and expansion of the normal structures. So this is useful for the surgical planning. 
MRI is more diagnostic in this condition. Uh, in MRI, when you give a contrast MRI or do an MRI angiogram, you can see the characteristic salt and pepper appearance. In this picture, you can see the MRI and uh, the MRI is having on the left side, you can see that uh, characteristic salt and pepper appearance. This uh, because the contrast uh, causes, uh, it's highly vascular and the contrast is seen in the vessels. At the same time, there are a lot of uh, dilated sinusoids and there are flow voids in between the vascular tumor. So the combination of uh, contrast flowing through the capillaries and well as the flow voids which occur to give this characteristic salt and pepper appearance. MRI is also useful for looking at the involvement of the surrounding structures. For example, the enhancement of the dura here, you can see here or on the cerebellum, you can see the enhancement of the meningeal layers. So it all the, all the neuros and also uh, it is also useful for diagnosis in cases where you are not sure what is the tumor. You have not yet done any biopsy. You won't uh, get approximate diagnosis before going for any further intervention. Digital subtraction angiography is also a useful tool. It is usually done before procedure and uh, before doing any embolization. The red arrow mark is showing the vascular tumor which is blush, blush on angiography. Other investigation to rule out a catecholamine secreting. In case there is a catecholamine secretion, you have to take appropriate measures while giving anesthesia to avoid a catecholamine storm. And uh, biopsy is useful when there is a confusion, when the tumor is not very vascular, under precaution in the OT, biopsy can be done. And uh, there is bound to be a lot of bleeding from the tumor, which is controlled by bipolar diathermy during the biopsy. So in case you suspect that it's a glomus and you're doing biopsy, you can take uh, consent in advance from the patient. Also, you can uh, prepare for the bleeding by arranging blood and uh, take making sure all the equipment for hemostasis is available. When you diagnose the patient clinically and you do the relevant investigations, then you know approximately the extent of the tumor and the spread of the tumor. Like I said before, the anatomic classification, there are two types. One is glomus tympanicum, where the tumor is in the middle ear, and the glomus jugular, where the tumor is in the jugular foramen or jugular fossa and uh, the behavior of both these tumors is slightly different. Therefore, Glasscock-Jackson classification is used for classifying the extent and spread of the tumors. It is slightly different for the glomus tympanicum tumors and the glomus jugular tumors. For the glomus tympanicum tumors, the uh, classification classifies the tumors into four types. One, two, three, and four. Type one is a very small tumor which is confined to the promontory of the middle ear. Type 2 is a larger tumor completely filling up the middle ear space. Type 3 fills the middle ear and extends to the mastoid. And type 4 is a middle ear, middle ear and mastoid tumor eroding medially and extending to the, sorry, eroding laterally and extending to the external artery canal or anteriorly near the internal carotid artery. So if the tumor goes beyond this confines of the middle ear involving the jugular for a man, then it becomes a glomus jugular. Glomus jugular is a tumor, it involves the jugular bulb, middle ear and mastoid. You might be wondering why this tumor arises in the jugular bulb and middle ear. Like I said, it arises from the uh, neural crest cells which are found around the jugular bulb and they, they form the chemoductal cells. Basically, these cells detect the changes in the pressure and composition, chemical composition of the venous blood which comes out from the brain. So these cells actually mutate and they form a benign tumor which is called glomus tumor. That's why it is more common in these regions. Other places it can be found in the thorax near the large vessels. It can be found in the abdomen near the kidneys and adrenal glands. Glomus jugular can be classified again into four types, one, two, three and four. Type 1 tumor is a small tumor involving the jugular bulb, middle ear and mastoid. Type 2 tumor is a tumor extending under internal auditory canal. So it is extended uh, below the cochlea and the infralabyrinthine cell tract 
and reaching medially till the inter internal auditory canal. It may have an intracranial extension. Type 3 is extending more medially. It has gone uh, medial to the internal auditory canal into the petrous it also may have an intracranial extension and type 4 is extended from the jugular foramen or jugular fossa beyond the petrous apex into the clivus or intratemporal fossa of the brain and have an intracranial extension. So based on the extension of the tumor from laterally to medially, it is classified into boundaries. First is uh, just in jugular bulb. Second one is still internal artery canal. Third one is still petrous apex. Fourth one is beyond petrous apex. Type 3 can again be divided into 3A, 3B, K. For this much, it's basically it helps us to plan the surgical approach and also it helps us in uh, it also helps us in deciding on the extent of surgery and also the prognosis claim there's one more classification for glomus tumors this is known as fish classification but this is for uh, it is in this fish classification the tumors are derived into types a b c d and e in type Type A tumor is confined to the middle ear. In type B, it's limited to the tympanomastoid area with no bone destruction in the infralabyrinthine compartment. In type C, it involves infralabyrinthine compartment and extends to the petrous apex. Type D, there is intracranial extension less than 2 cm in diameter. And type E, there is intracranial extension more than 2 cm in diameter. So this is a combined classification for glomus tympanicum and jugular. As you see, there is uh, type A and type B is a glomus tympanicum. Type C, D, and E are glomus jugular, which are extending medially. Fish, you, the Professor Hugo Fish was a very famous uh, Swiss surgeon, and uh, he is a very famous uh, skull-based surgeon, and he has devised various novel surgical techniques to approach the lateral skull base. So his techniques are quite famous. We'll be discussing about these later. The treatment for uh, glomus tumor is basically surgical removal as much as possible wherever the definitive treatment is to remove the tumor in entirety without leaving anything behind in case the surgical removal is not possible or after removing it surgically also there is a residual or there, there is a recurrence of the tumor then radiation therapy helps to slow down the growth of the tumor However, radiation therapy has various other side effects, especially when you're giving it to the skull base. It can cause uh, neuropathies, it can cause pituitary involvement. So it is not the preferred mode of treatment. So if the patient is unfit for surgery, for example, very old patient, frail patient, diabetic, cardiac disease, you cannot operate or the disease is very extensive and patient doesn't want surgery or will not tolerate surgery, then you can go for radiation therapy. The last treatment which is available is called embolization. Here a catheter is passed under radiological guidance into the venous system and uh, the tip is uh, extended until you reach the feeding vessel of the tumor. And uh, there you inject a dye and visualize the tumor similar to the angiography which we saw earlier. Once the catheter is in the appropriate vessel, you can inject a uh, bolus of a material which blocks the feeding arterioles and uh, leads to uh, starvation of the tumor and shrinkage of the tumor. It reduces the vascularity, therefore it can be used preoperatively or it can be used independently as a measure to shrink the tumor prior to radiation therapy, serial embolization. Okay, so let me see if I can uh, share the commonest malignancy of the temporal bone is squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma is commonest in the middle age groups, that is 40 to 60 years age group. Again, because it is commonest in that age group, it doesn't mean it doesn't occur in any other age group. Here also, the females are more commonly affected compared to males. Usually, the, most of them have associated chronic otitis media. One of the theories is that the chronic otitis media causing recurrent inflammation of the middle ear cleft predisposes to the formation of squamous cell carcinoma in middle age. It has also been found to be common in radium dial painters. So if you have been following your Hollywood movies, there is a movie called Radium Girls. 
at one point of time the watch dials were painted with luminous radium and uh, they did not know the ill effects of radium exposure so many of the girls uh, were used to paint the dial uh, and then they used to moisten the tip of the brush with their lips and in this way they became exposed to huge doses of radium and uh, from this we see that uh, these people who were exposed have a high uh, tells commercial carcinoma also there is a link I've, uh, if you those of you who are interested can see the preview of the movie okay this is very uncommon we'll start by saying that really uncommon but among the malignancies which can occur squamous cell carcinoma is the commonest malignancy apart from that next common will be basal cell carcinoma adenoid cystic carcinoma and adenocarcinoma in decreased uh, frequency of incidence histology the if you take a biopsy of this tumor and then you do hnd staining and look at it in the slide you will see the typical features of squamous cell carcinoma basically you will see a basilar membrane and then there will be layers of cells and then formation of keratin layers of epithelial cells and formation of keratin so if it is well defined like this it is a well differentiated tumor otherwise you can get a moderately differentiated poorly differentiated or anaplastic tumor those who are more interested can go through the histological subtypes they are divided into keratinizing type which have the worst prognosis undifferentiated type with intermediate prognosis and non keratinizing type with a good prognosis so this is according to the latest uh, ajcc class the if the tumor occurs in the middle ear or aspid it can spread into the petrosex it can spread anteriorly to the temporomandibular joint parotid gland and intratemporal fossa it can spread through the eustachian tube into the nasopharynx it can destroy the ossicles of the middle ear it can destroy the facial canal causing facial palsy involvement of facial nerve also it can erode the trilamellar bone and involve the inner ear posteriorly it can spread to the mastoid it can involve the jugular bone bulb carotid canal and internal auditory meatus clinical features of uh, malignancy of the temporal bone are foul smelling blood stained discharge the characteristic is blood stained discharge the patient has an inordinately severe ear pain with a nocturnal predilection uh, the if you look at the external artery canal there can be ulceration or formation of a polypoid mass or granulation which is visible in the external artery canal the lymph nodes which drain the middle ear and external artery canal that is the periauricular lymph nodes anterior auricular post auricular and infra auricular lymph nodes and the upper deep cervical lymph nodes can be initially involved the, there may be features of complications of cicle of a tumor spreading and eroding surrounding structures such as facial palsy sensory neural loss vertigo and other cranial palsies so similar to the glomus tumors initially when we investigate the patient with a suspected malignancy of the temporal bone the first investigation will be a hrct of the temporal bone hrct shows the characteristic erosions such as seen here the arrow marks point out to the erosion compared to the other side there are bony erosions okay you can see the anterior spread here into the temporomandibular joint in this picture and it can even uh, cause uh, inflammation and uh, sclerosis of the surrounding bone this since it is a long standing slowly spreading tumor sometimes it can cause sclerosis of the surrounding bone as well if you take an mri you can, basically the importance of the mri is that you can look at the surrounding structures involvement of the dura and spread into the surrounding soft tissue as these arrow marks are pointing out you can show the spread of the tumor via the eustachian tube into the nasopharynx or anterior spread or even you can look medially whether it's involved in the dura or other meninges the malignancies of the temporal bone are classified based on university of pittsburgh pnm staging system okay since these tumors are quite rare they are not formally classified in the ajcc classification 
we're still using the old classification which is known as the university of pittsburgh tnm staging system so according to this based on the tumor size and location and spread that is t nodal involvement m and uh, metastasis m based on these three factors we can get approximately the prognosis and the treatment plan for the tumors if the tumor is very small and involved in only external artery canal and this t1 if it's limited to external artery canal with limited bone erosion it is t2 these two you have learnt in the previous class with dr ayman so i will not go into detail uh, the t3 tumors are the tumors involving the mid layer and the mastoid with limited soft tissue involvement and t4 tumors are the extensive tumors extending and to the uh, eroding the cochlea petas apex medial wall of mid layer carotid canal jugular foramen dura and other uh, soft tissues are eroded it spreads anteriorly or into the nasopharynx it is spread beyond the it is called for t3 is limited to mid layer and mastoid t4 is spread beyond the layer okay involvement of the lymph node is a poor prognostic finding as you all know and any nodal involvement automatically considered as advanced disease that is if there is even a single involved lymph node then it goes immediately into stage 3 and okay so after you get a tnm classification basically you go for a staging of the tumor so if the tumor size is t3 or 4 only then it will be a middle layer or mastoid tumor t1 1 and 2 tumors are external artery canal tumors so immediately we go into stage 2 3 or 4 if it is a t3 tumor that is involving only the middle layer and mastoid without any extension and there is no nodal involvement then it becomes stage 2 if there is any nodal involvement as mentioned before it goes to stage 3 and any uh, t4 tumors that is extending out of middle layer with any nodal involvement goes to stage 4 of the prognostic staging basically stage 3 tumors have a very low uh, prognosis the 5 year average survival rate is around 30 40% and t4 stage 4 tumors 5 year average survival rate is less than 20% okay so you can immediately get the prognosis for the tumors and also you must be very aggressive when you are going for treatment because of poor prognosis the now again uh, there are two modalities of treatment for malignancy of the temporal bone the first modality is radiotherapy so radiotherapy is a palliative measure when multiple cranial nerves are involved or when a tumor is otherwise unresectable surgery is the main treatment option the surgical procedure where the tumor is removed end block along with the involved part of the temporal bone is known as temporal bone resection okay temporal bone resection based on the amount of temporal bone removed is classified into three types first one is lateral temporal bone resection next is subtotal temporal bone resection and three is the total temporal bone resection what are these types why are they classified into three parts this picture is gives you a very good idea if you look at the picture there is a fine dotted line which is marked as one those of you who are unable to see clearly can open the ppts in a separate window i have shared the link for the ppt using the class notebook okay there is a fine dotted line labeled as one okay so this is the extent of resection of the lateral temporal bone resection basically the mid layer part of the mid layer including the uh, tympanic membrane incus malleus and external artery canal and part of the mastoid all of these are removed and the tumor is removed in toto so this is uh, preferred in uh, tumors which are isolated to the middle ear only so here what we do is mastoidectomy canal wall down mastoidectomy we remove the tumor end block along with the tympanic membrane the skin of the esc and the malleus and incus here the stapes foot plate is preserved we are not going to go into the inner ear we are going to preserve the inner ear after resecting this entire part that is external artery canal tympanic membrane mastoid everything is removed 
then we had closed the mind pouch closure the next level of resection is known as subtotal temporal bone resection in this type of resection here you can see a larger dotted line in the slide okay in this type of resection i'm just tracing out the dotted line for your uh, convenience okay in subtotal temporal bone resection basically it's a lateral skull based procedure you are going to remove almost the entire temporal bone leaving behind only the petrous part of the temporal bone the resection extends from the external artery canal medially up to the internal auditory canal so all the intervening structures including cochlea labyrinth part of the uh, eustachian tube bone the uh, zygomatic part of the zygomatic bone mastoid everything is removed in block in toto okay after removal of this block of uh, temporal bone obviously none of the ear functions are going to be there there is going to be complete labyrinth and dysfunction complete cochlear dysfunction and you are going to close it by using the soft tissue flap to obliterate the cavity the last type of resection is in advanced tumors where the tumor has extended beyond the internal artery canal into the petrous clivus intracranially etc that temp temporal bone resection is known as temporal total temporal bone resection it is shown in the picture with the solid line you can trace the solid line in the picture and uh, this is a combined ent and neurosurgical procedure uh, where the there is a craniotomy done lateral craniotomy is done and then the brain is retracted and then the entire temporal bone is completely uh, drilled out or uh, gouged out and removed completely and then the cavity which is formed is directly since there is exposure of the meninges and possibly if the meninges are involved when you are removing part of the meninges all that has to be reconstructed usually we use a soft tissue flap if the temporalis muscle is not involved that is the easiest flap in this case uh, we use that and then we repair the dura also and uh, everything is closed up this is this procedure is very rarely done and it is done in uh, along with the neurosurgeon one is because we are going to most likely open the meninges secondly the internal artery canal uh, the internal uh, carotid artery is also likely to be involved and it also has to be in this procedure okay uh, i hope most of you could listen to most of the lecture at least okay okay now i am i am showing the histology of the glomus tumor people who are unable to see the slide can open the slide again like i said from the class notebook and look at it separately now the glomus tumor characteristically has this feature it has a sheet of a mass of cells with large nuclei okay these are only the uh, catecholamine secreting or non secreting neural crest originated cells this is the main tumor cells along with that there are many vascular sinusoids without any muscular layer this tumor doesn't have any surrounding capsule these are the features of the glomus tumor okay you can uh, based on the location of the tumor characteristic histological findings you can arrive at a diagnosis if there is any doubt possibly immunohistochemistry can also be done okay so next question was about investigations or uh, sorry brown sign okay so you all saw the video which shows the red vascular tumor which is behind the intact tympanic membrane in such a patient i have not shown the brown sign in this video in this patient if you take something called cell is a oral speculum which has a capacity to increase and decrease the external auditory canal pressure by pressing a small bulb which is connected to it so this airtight speculum is introduced to the external artery canal and then we inflate the bulb increasing the external artery canal pressure so when we inflate the external artery canal in a pressure then what happens is the pressure get transmitted across the tympanic membrane to the tumor and the tumor gets blanched okay so this tumor blanching or increasing the external artery canal pressure is known as brown sign i hope uh, whoever had the doubt you
next doubts radiological investigations so okay one person asked what is pulsatile tinnitus pulsatile tinnitus first of all is a perception of sound in the absence of any uh, objective external sound source okay so this is divided into two types non pulsatile and pulsatile pulsatile tinnitus means there will be a pulsation of the sound okay along usually along with the pulse it will for example ush 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 like that it will be pulsating okay if you compress the major vessels in the neck for this patient then the pulsations will stop this the type of tinnitus is called pulsatile tinnitus it's a characteristic of any vascular tumor in the temporal bone or posterior cranial fossa okay so it is a, something which is described by the patient uh, usually we don't check for it but in very highly vascular tumors or aneurysms especially there if you place a stethoscope on the ear or on the large vessels of the neck you can hear uh, gruy sometimes that is not a very constant or reliable sign okay patient has to describe that he has a pulsatile tinnitus it is by history okay this is the findings now radiologically usually for any skull based tumor you have to do both hrct and you have to do uh, mri both have to be done hrct will be both plain as well as contrast for tumors we have to check for involvement of the vessels we have to check for involvement of the bone and we have to check for intracranial involvement each of these investigations gives separate excuse me <coughs> separate information about this thing the plasmatic is good information about the bone the contrast gives information about the vascular involvement and the mri gives information about the involvement of the meninges and other soft tissue structures then this this is probably a contrast hrct here you can see the erosion of the bone and also slight contrast blushing of the okay. in the ct scan we see involvement of the vessels mri involvement of the other soft tissues in case of glomus tumors it also gives us a characteristic finding which is salt and pepper appearance now what is the salt and pepper appearance look at this mri on the left side of the screen okay on, uh, on your left side of the screen you can see that there is a tumor compared to the right side in mri bone is black okay so here the temporal bone is black the tumor has been enhanced by the contrast that means there are lot of blood vessels and the, there is a contrast flowing through the tumor however in between this contrast enhanced tumor you see some black dots okay so this is because there is a, a large sinusoids in the tumor and there will be a flow of voids and stagnation of blood within the sinusoids so this type of appearance is characteristically known as salt and pepper because salt is white and pepper is black so it is called salt and pepper appearance okay aneurysm cannot be a differential diagnosis for glomus tumors because it is very characteristically found in the large vessels and the appearance of the aneurysm is also very clear it is usually a uh, sinusoidal shaped uh, 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 enlargement and on uh, radiology you can clearly make out clinically you will not get the brown sign and rising sun sign usually with the aneurysms if the aneurysms are large enough uh you, you can't see the temporal bone unless they are so large that they damage the bone completely in which case it's a very advanced tumor and possibly patient may not live long okay uh any other doubts any doubts about uh, squamous cell carcinoma and i can see the q and a and publishing the questions which i have answered how do we identify structures in ct and mri first thing you should have a good knowledge of the anatomy secondly you should have a good knowledge about the uh, how the radiological investigation response and uh, behaves for example 
in CT scan, you should know what are Hounsfeld units and uh, you should know what are the various uh, things which are white and which are black. Uh, in MRI, you should know the various sequences which are available, which have been done. What are the characteristic findings? Only after knowing all these things, you can interpret the CT and MRI. So you cannot forget your anatomy and then say, I want to interpret the MRI or CT scan. Okay. And knowledge of anatomy of the region to be interpreted is most important. Afterwards, knowledge of the investigation itself is important. And then you can interpret the radiological investigation. Catecholamine secreting. Okay, no, most tumors are not. Only about 3% of tumors are catecholamine secreting. Therefore, uh, you have to be on the watch for it clinically as well as by investigations. At the same time, uh, it is uh, quite unusual to get a catecholamine secreting tumor. Okay. Interested further in this topic, also go through the surgical videos. Some surgical videos are extremely long, but that is the surgeries themselves are that long. So what you can do is you can skip the videos in between and play it at a higher speed and just go through to get an idea how these surgeries are done. OK, so do you so are the neural crest cells, neuroendocrine cells? Yes, neural crest cells only give rise to the neuroendocrine cells and uh, these specialized neuroendocrine cells are the cells which uh, monitor the uh, oxygen saturation and blood composition. Basically, these cells only they form the glomus tumor. 